We're going to have some specials. As you can see, parable of the fig tree. Jesus told every Christian, all the followers that would follow him, you must, he didn't say maybe you should get around to it, he said learn the parable of the fig tree. It was necessary for you to understand and serve as a Christian. That's how important it is. And that is to say, and understand God's Word. That's why Christ was so emphatic that you learn that parable. The fig then becomes a very important thing because it's used symbolically to say a great deal more than is even written. And we're going at this time to go into that parable of the fig tree. It will probably take us about two days. And we're going to tackle it. Let's understand the simplicity in which Christ taught. Turn with me with the word of wisdom from our Father in Yeshua, Jesus' precious name, chapter 7 of the book of Matthew. And let's begin with verse 15. Now, listen to the words of Christ, all right? He says, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing. In other words, they look like a Christian. One of the, uh, Christ's followers. But inwardly they are raving wolves. In other words, one that claims to be a man of God, that is to say a prophet, and is not familiar with our Heavenly Father's Word, can only be influenced by the traditions of the world, and the wolf naturally is symbolic of Satan himself. So naturally, when they assume traditions, though they would faint if you were to say they were doing the work of Satan when they claim to be uh, prophets, ministers, teachers, evangelists, but if they are teaching traditions of men rather than the words of Christ, they are dangerous. Because the way you deceive one is one that wants to follow Christ and respects a symbol, an individual that stands claiming to be of Christ and doesn't know anything about what Christ teaches or said that you are in good standing with the Father who is the judge of all. Beware of false prophets. 16. How do you know them? Listen to the simplicity in which Jesus taught. 16. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? In other words, what Christ is telling you, it's really this simple. Do men gather grapes off of a thorn bush, the bramble bush, which is the bramble thorn is symbolic of Satan. Okay, remember the, back in the Old Testament, the trees which wanted to be king and the bramble bush, the thorn bush said, I'll be your king as long as you'll promise you'll stay in my shade or shadow. And a thorn bush doesn't cast a shadow. You see, no protection. I, I don't want, I, I want to beg that no one think I'm talking down to anyone, but what is Christ talking about here? Well, the subject was open about prophets, ministers, teachers, evangelists, someone that claims to be teaching God's Word or speaking of His prophecies. Now, anyone is intelligent enough to know that you're not going to get grapes off of a thorn bush or that you're not going to get figs off of a thistle. Well, how does that apply to people then? If someone that is a one verse Charlie or never quite gets around to opening God's Word and that's what every Christian is supposed to absorb, then you're eating off of a thistle, friend. A thistle that doesn't amount to a hill of beans. You get grapes from the vine, and Christ is the vine, and this is Christ's Word. Now, anyone is intelligent enough to pick up on that in the simplicity in which He teaches. Well, what do you mean? I mean, test their fruit. Do they teach God's Word or do they not? End of subject. 
Uh, one verse, Charlie, doth not teach God's Word. He teaches the traditions of men. God's Word is taught chapter by chapter and verse by verse because only God Himself through the prophets that He sent can keep the subject and the object in the, in the order in which it consummates the object or subject that Christ or our Father wishes to bring forth to your mind. So you test the fruit of a prophet, teacher, minister, evangelist by whether or not their fruit, that is to say that that comes forth, is God's Word. It's that simple. Got it? Okay. 17. Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit. In other words, if someone really teaches God's Word, it brings forth good fruit, that is to say, uh, people's minds filled with God's truth, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. In other words, there, a corrupt tree that claims to be a tree of prophecy is going to actually be a bunch of beggars. That's what it's going to end up being because God will not support them. Thus, they must become beggars. I know I may offend some, but it's time, you know, we're in the final generation, which this parable of the fig tree, that's one of the reasons Christ wanted you to learn it. So you're, you're either participating in church or you're practicing sideshow politics, shenanigans, bad fruit. A good tree, that is to say, if you teach, you see, what trees are we talking about? Go back to the beginning. There was the tree of life which is Christ Himself, and there was the tree of good and evil, which is Satan. Oh, he can seem to be so very good, but he is from inside as the wolf, evil. Which tree will you partake of? Are you intelligent enough to understand when you hear God's Word chapter by chapter or verse by verse, or some prattling uh, wolf in sheep's clothing or a preacher's robe, that never quite gets around to mentioning the Father, the Son, or especially the Word. Man doesn't have all that much to say to you, my friend. Uh, anyone that has lived any years at all on this earth knows that compared to our Father, man has really very a few important thoughts concerning the eternity. They all come from our Father, for all wisdom flows from Him. Okay, you got that? It's real simple. Let's follow it. 18, a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Hey, once you spot them, mark them. They're not going to change, most likely. 19, every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. God starts judging at the pulpit. And there will be many that will be hewn down. That's what he's talking about. Beware of false prophets, which appear to be sheep, but they're a wolf in sheep's clothing, raving. Be very careful. Playing church is a dangerous thing without the aid of our Father's blessings, that is to say, His Word. It's a very serious thing. 20. Wherefore... By their fruits ye shall know them. Know who? False prophets, false preachers, false teachers. You will know them by their fruit, whether they are beggars or men or women of God. It's that simple. Verse 21. Not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven... In other words, there's your answer. Well, how do I know the will of my Father in heaven? From His Word. Is that difficult? This is the tree that you partake of. This is the same tree, and as much as the living Word is Christ, then it is the tree of life um, that you discover in the 22nd chapter of Revelation that gives life for the eternity and your good fruit is right here from the Word of God. And what God is saying, everyone that says, Lord, Lord, is not going to make it. 
because there are many that say, Lord, Lord, and absolutely have no conception of what the Word of God teaches in reality, in the simplicity in which Christ taught. Verse 22, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Question. Oh, hey, they spent years of bapity, 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 bapity. Preach, 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 preach. And probably have not taught one chapter from God's Word. But they told about old Aunt Hannah and old Uncle Joe and, and Billy Joe from Kokomo and what a great person they were. You know, what God, you know what Christ is going to say to characters like that that claim to be preachers, teachers, and prophets of God's Word? And in thy name have we cast out devils. Oh, yes, we've held revivals and we've chased those devils around the room. And in thy name have many wonderful works. We've built such great, wonderful buildings in thy name. 23. And then, Christ speaking, well, I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Get out of my sight. Do you know, are you a fruit inspector? Are you intelligent enough that you can tell whether someone is teaching God's word? To teach God's word, you must read from his word. You must convey the thought that God has in the metaphors, idioms, figures of speech, acrostics, customs of the time, and let the Word do the teaching in the simplicity in which Christ taught to be teaching Christ's Word. Aunt Nellie don't get it done. All right, and that's no uh, disrespect to Aunt Nellie. It's just that no one, nothing can replace the good fruit from the Word of God. Can you begin to see why Christ said you must learn? Learn the parable of the fig tree. This is kind of the basic step. Well, and I know some are going to say, well, when did he say that? Uh, well, first, let's see a little more about the fig before we turn with me to the 11th chapter of this. Uh, of um, no, let, I'll tell you what, let's go on to Mark. Let's put it together right. When did Christ say that? Let's get it first. Mark chapter 13. <clears throat> let's go to verse 28 where he made this statement. Christ has just told of the coming of the false Messiah and how that you must be educated from His Word. He stipulates in verse 6 of that same chapter, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. They're going to claim to be a teacher of Christ's word, but they're a bunch of fakes. There's going to be many. He didn't say a few, but a lot that claim to teach God's word, but never quite get around to it. And then he tells of the coming of Antichrist and how God's elect would stand against that spurious Messiah rather than the trot of being blasted off into the atmosphere with their flyaway doctrine. It is not written. And the ignorance of the Greek is what causes many to fall the fallacy, follow the fallacy. He did not say maybe the false Christ would come before we gathered back to him. He stated in verse 22 of this same chapter, For false Christ and false prophet shall rise. The problem is, are you going to listen to them? Well, how do I know? He just told you. You listen to one that produces the vine or the tree of God's Word and teaches you how to deal with it whereby you can understand it. Now, concerning the one subject that we're following now, the fig tree, verse 28. Let's have it on the screen, if we may. Of the 13th chapter of Mark, Christ continuing in that same vein. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. He didn't say maybe. He didn't say perhaps, he said, learn it. When her branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, did it say fruit? No. When it putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. Well, what summer? It's harvest time, end of the world. The question at the beginning of this chapter is when is the end of the world coming? 
When is Christ returning? And he gives the seven events that are the seven trumpets that consummate the end of this age. Are you familiar with them? I pray you are. We just covered the book of Revelations. You should be. You see, you learn a great deal when you listen to the teachings of God and get the real fruit right from the source, the living tree, rather than a bunch of traditions. Betty by stories, sweet by and by, all you have to do is, all you have to do is get the fruit from the right tree. There's only one that's the Word of God, regardless of who is the reader or whatever. The only fruit comes from the true tree of life, which is to say Christ, the living Word, this Word. Verse 29, So ye in like manner... When ye shall see these things come to pass, that's the seven events that consummate this, the end of this age, and they are rapidly, know that it is nigh even at the doors. In other words, you're right at the door of the end of the age. That's how you tell. What do you mean how you tell? The parable of the fig tree. That's why we're teaching it. Okay? 30. Verily I truly, seriously, I say unto you that this generation shall not pass till all these things, things be done. You see how important it is? Because when you know the parable of the fig tree, you know that when it is established, that that generation will be the final generation. No man knows as if you were to follow the three uh, units are, are put into one article, which is to say a year, month, date, so forth, which means instant. Nobody knows the instant. But God's elect should know the season, which is to say generation. All you have to do is understand the parable of the fig tree then, and you know that generation. It is not a man figuring dates but a sign from Almighty God and a promise that is true and shall come to pass exactly as it's written during the generation in which the final seven steps, which are the seven seals, the seven plagues, and the seven trumps. In other words, each of the things uh, spoken of and brought out and documented in this 13th chapter consummate the end of this age and the parable of the fig tree basically sets the parameters of the generation. You will know when we finish this lecture on the parable of the fig tree. It is necessary that you understand it. When you understand the parable of the fig tree, you understand why Eve and Adam put fig leaves over their private parts when they had sinned. It's part of the parable in knowing who the false ones come to, the false prophets, those that Christ will say, get out of my sight. I never knew you. And there would be some that would say, well, that's not what the scripture said. He said, depart from me. <laughs> Have you ever heard him say depart when he was angry? Was Christ ever angry? Yes, he was. Righteous indignation. We're going to turn to one of the times that he was continuing step by step building in your mind how to test the fruit of whether a minister is a real minister, teacher, or whatever you follow or a student yourself of what you are to read and what you are to take fruit off of to be better informed of God's Word. I quite frankly, aside from, from books written by men uh, relating historical events, or documentation of travels or so forth of peoples, as far as someone writing a book that improves upon God's Word, do you know what I want to tell you? I think it's a waste of time. Don't pick man's book. Some character was going to correct me on the, on the rapture theory, so-called, and he, he was so stupid that he dared use a man's writing of the end of the world. Now that is about to tell this scholar, a student of the text, 
to do that is an insult. The person that wrote the book he was speaking of didn't have enough sense to pour water out of a boot, much less comment on God's Word. And poor innocent fools are sucked in because they cannot understand the simplicity of, honey, go to the right tree to pick your fruit and you'll be all right, which is the Word of God. No, they got to filter around in the dark and grab a hold of every false doctrine in the, wor in the world and expect to stumble over the truth as though it were a needle in a haystack when it was there all the time. That's what Christ is telling you. Learn the parable of the fig tree. All right, I can really get wrapped up on this subject because people are being deceived in this generation and a child should be able to see it when they understand the teachings of God's truth. Chapter 11, verse 11 in the same book of Mark. <clears throat> Learn the parable of the fig tree. Listen and grow in your father's word. And Jesus entered into Jerusalem and into the temple. Do you know what the temple is? God's house. And when he had looked around about upon all things, and now the eventide was come, and he went out unto Bethany with the twelve. In another scripture it says he looked angrily. He sighed, which means he snorted when he saw what was going on. They were selling mite infested doves and money changing right in God's house uh, when God's word is supposed to be taught there. And offerings of the best of your flock rather than rushing down and stopping at the quick trip on the, uh, quick trip on the temple steps and buying some fuzzy, sickly dove and trying to offer it to God as a peace offering. He wasn't happy. Verse 12, And on the morrow, the next day, when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry. Verse 13, And seeing a fig tree, wake up for me, And seeing a fig tree afar off having leaves, he came. If haply it he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of figs was not yet. Do you think for one moment that Christ did not know the season of figs? That is to say, when they ripen and when they don't ripen? Of course he did. He knew there were no figs and there were only leaves on this tree. And the reason he utilized it is for the simple reason, know when the leaves shoot forth. 14. And Jesus answered, said unto it, and this is Christ speaking to a tree. Sound strange? Well, listen, it says a great deal more than is written. Can you learn the parable behind it? I hope so. I pray so. No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever, period. And his disciples heard it. Do not cut yourself off from fig jam, which is probably one of the best jams in the world, because he's speaking to the bad fig. I hope if you learned one lesson about a fruit inspector that there are good trees and there are bad trees. And I'll teach you a little bit about the horticulture of a fig tree in a few moments and it will clarify for you. Listen on. 15. And they came to Jerusalem and Jesus went into the temple and began to cast out them that sold and bought in the temple. He took a cat of nine tails and he laid it to their backs. He hit those money tables and you could hear the coins as they rang, as they spilled, and he laid the whip to them and drove them out of the church of God and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves, might infested poor substitutes of your love for your father. And would not suffer that any man should carry any vessel through the temple. He stopped that commerce. 17, and he taught, say, you, you know when he taught? This is how, now you're getting fruit right from the vine. What did he teach? 
And he taught, saying unto them, Is it not written, My house shall be called of all nations the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. Unfortunately, that holds so true today that people get involved for their own gain and God only knows what all else, what reason, egos and so forth and never seem to get around to teaching the emotions of our Father and His outreaching love to the heart and mind of each soul that will love Him. The guidance that He gives us that keeps us from trouble, keeps us from the rocky shore and keeps us safe even in the flesh body. 18. And the scribes and the chief uh, priest heard it. These are your religious people. You got it? Preachers of the day. And sought how they might destroy him. Sweet folks. For they feared him because all the people were astonished at his doctrine. They tested the fruit and they kind of liked his fruit. 19. And when even was come, he went out of the city. What did he do? Verse 20, And in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree. I repeat, fig tree. Dried up from the roots. Boy, that's pretty fast service overnight. It documents and emphasizes the importance of the parable. 21, And Peter called to remembrance and said unto him, Master, that's to say, teacher, behold, the fig tree which thou cursedest is withered away. And Jesus answering said unto him, Have faith in God. Now this is not to say have faith in some man. Have faith in God and His Word. You know what faith is? 23. For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, that means this nation, be thou removed. And he's talking about the Kenite nation, the nation of the bad fig. Be thou removed and be thou cast into the city, sea and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Pretty strong statement, but it's strong in this sense. He's talking about the bad fig and its nation. And any individual that knows the truth, the real fruit from the proper tree, understands what he's saying. I want to get into the heart of culture just a little bit. We'll pick this up in the next lecture then so that you totally understand the parable, but you must understand this horticulture. Well, why would he use the fig tree? Because of its horticulture. You would see the entire picture if you looked. Anytime God uses something as a symbol, the entire life of that insect, animal, plant, or whatever gives you the most in-depth thought of his mind that he's relating to you. What about the fig tree? I'm going to use two uh, types. I'm going to use Smyrna, like the church of Smyrna. Smyrna fig is a very good fig. It's the female fig. And then there's the caprice, which is the male fig. Unedible. Terrible. You can't not eat them. They are so bad. Well, why would God create something like that? Well, listen. Listen. Number one, you do not plant a fig tree by a seed. You set out a shoot. And that is symbolic of the nation that would be planted of both the good and the bad fig that would consummate the end of the age, the generation, that is to say, the beginning of the final generation. So it's very important. Now, 
Many people feel that the fig is a non-blossoming plant, and that's false. You see, in the end of each fig, there's a tiny hole. And then inside the fig plant itself is the many, many blossoms inside the fig. Again, the Smyrna, or the good fig, is the female. The Capri is the male, or the goat fig, is what some keepers call it. And it likewise has the little hole with the flowers inside. It's the male. Now there is a little fig wasp. Yes, I said wasp. And you must gain every ounce of information fitting your generation because it was written, the parable of the fig tree was written to the final generation when the terminology wasp would mean more than a little flying bug. The wasp, though, which is known as the little fig wasp, goes into the little hole at the end of the fig on the caprice tree that man cannot eat and takes the pollen from the flowering plant from within and then goes to the Smyrna, the female tree, and pollinates the fig whereby the fig can have a continued life. In other words, the wasp, you can be thankful to it that both the good and the bad fig tree exist as God created them. And that, my dear friend, is very true today, that the dumb wasp, as some call them, and I certainly call some of them dumb, which offends a great many people, but be that as it may, I could care less. They support and make possible both trees also because of their ignorance of testing fruit, which is to say, understanding the living Word of God that they do not know one tree from the other. And I speak spiritually now, not the difference between the Smyrna and the Caprice. They don't know whether they're hearing the truth or not because they don't understand how to, the simplicity in which Christ taught. What tree is it coming from? If it's coming from the Word of God, then you're, you're practicing good fruit if the common sense in which Christ teaches flows with the subject and the teacher that is teaching teaches you how to understand it for yourself. That's the only way you will ever find the good mark of a teacher is that he teaches you how to check him or her out to document what they say, whether it is true or not, not from traditions of men or some stupid book about end times written by some nut claiming to be a Christian, and many people say, well, that's old Barney. Everybody knows Barney. Barney's, I love you, you love me, we have got a family. Now, now, God bless the lady that brought forth the character that teaches love to children. Unfortunately, there's nothing but a bunch of children playing church that the Barney song would fit quite well to sum up their entire works as far as fruit being produced. So, it is no accident that the church of Smyrna, the good fig, teaches who the Kenites are. For the Kenites, as you will find in the next lecture, are the bad goat fig that brings forth, even into this day, and helps you better understand what would happen in the final generation whereby you could tell that that consummates the end of this age. It's very simple. So simple the way Christ teaches. All you have to do is understand the heart of culture of the fig and observe the seven signs given before that and then you really enlarge your understanding, your knowledge, concerning the final generation. I hope you don't miss the last part of this lecture because we're going to nail it, document it, the parable of the fig tree and the generation to which it applies, applies by the actual setting forth of the shoot 
and where it was to be planted as it is written in God's Word. Don't ever, ever, ever let some religion tell you that it was planted in Rome. So bad. So, such vile fruit to say it's planted in Rome when God's Word tells you exactly where it's planted. Or San Francisco, this mountain of seven hills. Oh, we're so intelligent. Yes, seven, seven hills. Men, folly, ignorance, bliss, on it goes. I hope if you've learned any one thing from this lecture, though I may have angered some, I could care less. This is the good tree. If this is being taught, as Jesus would say, it is written. It certainly is. And do you know something, beloved? That's exactly how it's going to come to pass. So you have a choice. You can partake of this tree, the truth, and be informed, or you can listen to fuzzy heads, brains, and always wonder. It's up to you. And I'm saying, no man within himself knows. God's Word is the tree. That's my point, all right? Surely you can tell when you're being taught God's Word or man's Word, all right? How many verses, the last time you attended church, last time you attended Bible study, how many verses did you read from the Word of God? And I'm not talking about some quarterly that is a simulation written by God only knows who, maybe a servant of Satan disguised to translate quarterlies and so forth for a congregation that is biblically illiterate and would never know the difference. How many scriptures did you read from the Word of God with, with understanding? Now, I didn't say how many did you read, period. I said with understanding. You read with understanding because there is a teacher there, either who will explain it or gone through the Spirit gives you the knowledge to be able to pick up on it, that you have the tools necessary to take it back to the Greek, Hebrew, Chaldee, whatever the case may be, that you can see and understand the dual meanings in, of many scriptures even and feel that friendship and closeness to our Father by communicating with Him in His Word. What am I saying? Were you taught out of God's Bible or were you taught from some book published and printed by man? Hey friend, if you're not smart enough to know, you can get in trouble with this other junk. Coming from God's Word, you're never in trouble. Jesus said, that is the tree and that only. Do you know what He's going to say to many of these others? And some of them are good. I'm not knocking or anything. I'm just saying anytime you get away from the Word of God, you better have your safety belt on, friend. Because you may be in the group that He says, get out of my sight. I never knew you. You read that trash written by, do you know who? I would say the same thing. To those that t read quarterlies, do you know the individual that translated it from the Hebrew and Greek? I will even go as far to say, were they Christian? Because a Christian that will let a non-Christian do his translating for him is a fool. That simple. I'll document that. Many years ago, the the story was started that Christ was married to Mary Magdalena. And this is not an insult, but what he did, he stated a non-Christian translating the manuscript saw where Mary Magdalena was espoused to Christ. Well, now a Christian knows what that means. It was speaking spiritually. So they don't know, come here from Sikkim about translating Christian literature, so take it from the tree. I don't want to digress, but I want to nail the point. The child knows when they're studying God's Word or something else. Which do you want to answer to? Somebody else or God? I'll tell you who you're going to answer to, God. Think about it. 